Okay, I think we should go ahead and get started and I'm sure there'll be more people up joining soon with us. So welcome everyone to our Beyond the Scope um, series. It's been going on for a while now. Um, today is actually our first time at our new time. So 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. We'll be continuing at this time at least through the rest of the semester. Um, so with that, we also have our schedule set for the semester. So some of the upcoming talks that we'll be going through are gonna be in two weeks. We'll be talking, we'll have Thurman Fisher presenting about their Aviso software, which is available here at CMAS to use, um, followed by um, our director, David McComb. He'll be talking about energy electron loss spectroscopy in the TEMs. So a lot of stuff related to what you can learn about today with the introduction to TEM. Um, and then November, we'll start off um, with Carly Goodwin talking about um, some more advanced um, micro CT techniques. And then we'll finish off the semester before the break um, with Yoshi um, giving a talk about, I think it was Krauss Spark um, and some advanced things you can do in cryo electron microscopy to help complement um, her previous talk on cryo EM. Um, so today we have um, Hank Klein. He's Assistant Director of Research Operations at CMS. Along with um, those responsibilities, he is also the TM lab manager um, in charge of our two Techni instruments and also manages our XRD instruments. So a lot of stuff um, keeps him very busy and um, he also is Probably one of the most knowledgeable people I know in electron microscopy. So anytime I have questions about basically anything, it's always great having a chat with him. Um, and then again, with all these seminars, we try and keep them on the shorter end of things. So around 30 or so minutes. Um, so with the entire time, we have plenty of time for any questions and answers at the end. Okay, Hank. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, so let me start with uh, just giving you again the overview of what we have at CMAS. We have a number of TEMs, transmission electron microscopes, some of which can also be, uh, can function as STEMs, scanning transmission, EMs. Uh, we have some focused ion beam systems, as well as a number of uh, SEMs, and then the uh, other, other techniques. So uh, feel free to check in with us if you have any uh, needs or uh, particular interests. Uh, a little bit about myself. I was born in the UK, grew up in the Pittsburgh area, got my bachelor's at Drexel, my master's at Cornell. And I spent uh, five years at Xerox doing uh, TEM and OJ analysis. And then since I came here in 1982, I've done TEM, SEM, OJ, FIB, X-ray, and whatever else needed to be done. Uh, I've focused more on TEM and X-ray uh, diffraction since uh, we formed the CMAS in 2012. And uh, my primary outside activity right now is uh, doing cycling. Uh, I'm a ride leader for the Columbus Outdoor Pursuits. And when the gym is open and we don't have COVID, I try to get some swimming in as well. So to start with, uh, the question is, why do we do EM or electron microscopy in the first place? Well, the major reason is resolution. Light has a resolution limit of about a quarter of a micron, give or take, depending on wavelength and uh, numerical aperture and that sort of thing. Now here, what we're talking about is the ability to separate two objects. So you can sometimes pick up points of light that are much smaller than that, which is what happens in fluorescence microscopy, but here we're talking resolution as the ability to separate two distinct objects. And the reason for that primarily is the wavelength. Light has a wavelength, visible light, anywhere from a sort of 400 to 600 nanometers, uh, depending on how far you want to go into the blue and how far you want to go into the red. Uh, electrons, by contrast, have wavelengths of 0.002 to 0.004 nanometers. So we're talking, you know, somewhere 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth smaller wavelength. So inherently, uh, you should be able to get much better resolution 
by looking at things with electrons than with uh, photons, than with light. Uh, also, there is a difference in the way electrons interact with materials. Electrons uh, will generally be deflected or interact with the potentials around the nucleus, which means then that the scattering that the electrons see is very strongly dependent on the atomic number, Z. So for example, atoms like uh, uranium, osmium, lead, will scatter electrons uh, much more to higher angles than will elements like carbon or oxygen. So uh, we will use, make use of that as we try to image uh, samples in the microscope. Also, electrons are ionizing radiation. Now we can use that fact to help identify elements, and I'll have an example of that later. However, they will also damage the sample. You get radiolysis, you can get sputtering, you can get a number of effects that, that occur. And this is particularly uh, an issue in the biological community. So as the electrons uh, strike the sample, a number of things can happen. So your beam can come in and you will get secondary electrons and backscatters and characteristic x-rays. Those are all what you look at in uh, the SEM. You can get visible light that will generate cathodoluminescence, again, an SEM primarily an SEM technique, and OJ electrons, which is surface analysis. For TEM, we're primarily interested in what is transmitted through the sample. You can get elastically scattered electrons, um, which is most of what we use for imaging. You have the direct beam. You have inelastically scattered electrons, which you can use for EELS analysis. And you will also get characteristic x-rays. And we can do EDX analysis uh, in the TEM in the same way we can do that in the SEM, although at a higher spatial resolution. So as we're trying to image in the TEM, we have to think about what is causing our contrast. So there are different types. The first type would be amplitude contrast. So as the mass or the thickness of my sample increases, uh, I will get more scattering and that will appear darker in my image. So if I have heavy elements or have a high, very dense sample or a thicker part of the sample, that will appear darker than, uh, than a thinner part or, the or a hole in the sample. You can also get diffraction contrast. As the electrons go through the sample, they will diffract and you can pick up uh, crystallographic information from that. But also, you will scatter electrons out to a large angle, and you will start to pick up contrast because of that. As the wave goes through the sample, you will also pick up what's called phase contrast. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then when we get into the, uh, the hybrid technique, the scanning transmission EM, you will also start to pick up what's called Z contrast uh, it, with your high angle dark field detector. Now this uh, image may not resonate with everybody, but I'm old enough to remember slide projectors. You, everybody uh, used to dread the vacation slideshows that people would have. Basically, you have a light source that shines through your slide, your transparency, which is then projected onto a screen. But that's an exact analogy to what we have in the TEM. We are projecting a beam through our sample and onto a screen. Now, this is what we call a projection imaging system, and it is then an exact analogy to a standard light microscope, where you have your light coming in from underneath your microscope slide, going through your objective lens, which you can select several here, and then being viewed as a single image in your, through your eyepiece. Uh, so to compare them then, you have in a light microscope, you would have your light bulb, your source. You will generally have some sort of a condenser lens on a, on a good microscope, which allows you to focus your light down to a smaller area and make it brighter or spread the light out to make it a little bit dimmer. Through your sample, through the objective lens, which is on that turret, and then you project into the eyepiece. And then you can look through the eyepiece, the ocular, 
directly. In the TEM, we're generating electrons. We're now using magnetic lenses, and we will have some sort of a condenser system, normally two condenser lenses. We have an objective lens, and then we have some magnifying lenses, and generally there are more than one. And since we can't see the electrons directly, we project them onto a fluorescent screen that we can look at through a window on the microscope. So again, some of the differences now between light microscopy and electron microscopy. In light microscopy, we're using glass lenses. Now, the thing about glass lenses is they are fixed. They have a fixed shape, hence a fixed focal length and a fixed magnification. We can grind these lenses in either a convex or a concave shape, so we can get either converging or diverging uh, light rays. We can make compound lenses with different glasses, uh, which have slightly different refractive index and take care of some of the chromatic aberrations. So we can do some really nice things with glass lenses. The magnetic lenses, uh, in contrast, are variable strength. I can run a little more current through my magnet and change the strength of the lens, which is something you can't do with glass. So it gives us a little more flexibility. However, calibration now becomes a real issue because here you have one magnification, you figure out what it is, and it's like that for the rest, as long as that lens exists. Here, as I change my magnetic field, my, uh, my lens strength changes, so I have to be very careful about calibration. So we're using charged particles, which, as I mentioned, interact differently with your sample. So they interact with the uh, magnetic field by the, through the Lorentz force. Now, uh, when we start talking about lens quality, uh, people have described uh, the quality of a magnetic lens as roughly the same optical quality as trying to look through the bottom of a Coke bottle. Um, I don't know, in these days of cans, maybe you don't see too many bottles, but basically very, very poor quality. And any symmetric magnetic lens is converging only. You cannot make the equivalent of a concave lens uh, with a magnetic uh, field. And another difference now is that we can actually set our sample inside the magnetic field, which would be equivalent to setting the sample inside the piece of glass, which I think you can agree is fairly difficult. So the magnetic lenses are something like this. You have your beam coming down the axis, and then around this axis, we have windings. So this is wound in what's called a solenoid form. So our current is traveling this way. And when we have a coil like that, that means our magnetic field is axial. We then channel the field lines, magnetic field lines, through this uh, shell, iron shell, and into a pole piece area where the magnetic field is now concentrated. If you look at this, this looks a little bit like uh, the tip of a horseshoe magnet. And again, it's the same idea. We're concentrating the field right in one small area. By doing so, now this is where the lens action occurs. So this is, becomes our lens. So in the microscope now, we have quite a few lenses. So a micro, an electron microscope in concept would look something like this. We'd have some sort of an electron source, usually at the top of the microscope. We have, in most microscopes, we'll have two condenser lenses. Uh, some of the new ones now have three. We actually have two magnetic coils to form the objective lens. This is the equivalent of the turret on your light microscope. And the sample sits inside the magnetic field of this objective lens. And then on most microscopes, we'll have four magnifying lenses uh, to project down onto the viewing screen, which is down on the bottom. So it's a few more lenses than you have on a light microscope, but the concepts are about the same. So to see what it actually looks like in this pole piece area, this is a photo I took of one of the uh, microscopes we've had. So the pole pieces that focus the magnetic field down, you have two of them, an upper pole piece and a lower pole piece. You the sample has to sit inside this gap, which is about nine millimeters on uh, some of our microscopes. 
down to about five on others. And I've actually used microscopes with gaps as small as 2.7 millimeters. So there wasn't a lot of space in here. So these are the pole pieces that focus our magnetic field and it's concentrated in this gap. So inside the gap, you will have an objective aperture, which we're not gonna talk about too much today. There will be this cold finger, which in the very old days was used for trying to condense oil vapors from the uh, pumping system. Uh, these days it is used primarily for trapping water vapor as you load and unload the sample. And then the sample itself will sit exactly in the middle of this pole piece gap. So uh, it sits right in the middle of the magnetic field. The microscopes themselves will look something like this. So this is our Techni 30. You have a 300 kV electron source at the top. So the electrons are accelerated to 300 kilovolts. They come down through the condenser lenses. The sample sits on the center line at this point, and then the magnifying lenses are down below, and the viewing screen is down here in the fishbowl. Some of the other microscopes we have, this is our, uh, one of our Titans, are actually sitting, you have a similar kind of a column, but sitting inside a box to minimize uh, environmental uh, disturbances. And we even move the people outside of the room. So you have uh, you know, a much bigger microscope taking a lot more space. But to get the ultra high resolution, that's what you need to do. Now what I've done is I've described so far uh, a projection microscope, which is a transmission electron microscope. You can also, like in a scanning electron microscope, raster the beam. And you would have the same concept, whether it's an SEM, uh, a STEM, or even one of the scanned probe microscopes like an AFM, atomic force microscope. The, the idea is you step some sort of a probe across the sample and you map the, a signal that comes out into your final image. And this can be either uh, the secondary electrons that you would have in an SEM, transmitted electrons that you'd have in a STEM, the AFM signal, the force signal uh, in an AFM. You could have X-rays and do X-ray mapping. So whatever signal you have coming out can be mapped this way. So for the TEM or the STEM, we're talking about focusing a fine beam of electrons onto our sample. We will have X-rays coming out and we can map those into our image and do an X-ray map. We can have the transmitted electrons, which would be a bright field image, or we can take scattered electrons, which would be a dark field image, and we'll primarily use the high angle annular dark field detector, or HADF. Now, if instead of using a bright field detector on these on-axis electrons, we move that detector out of the way, we can take these transmitted electrons and run these into an electron energy loss spectrometer or EELS spectrometer. So when the electrons generate these X-rays, they have had to provide the energy to ionize the atom. And we can look at that spectrum because now coming out of the sample, we will have a spectrum with somewhat lower energies based on what X-rays they have generated. And Professor McComb will be describing this in, uh, in a few weeks. So as we're looking through the sample, we are looking uh, at a projection actually of a 3D object. And we now need to be careful because even though our sample is very, very thin, it is not zero thickness. And you have to be careful about interpreting what you see. This is a fairly famous photo of the two-headed rhinoceros illustrating that in projection, you can get some interesting effects. So be aware of that. People have misinterpreted images that have come out of the TEM by forgetting that they are actually looking at a 3D object. It's thin, but not zero thickness. Also, just something to be aware of is that we're looking at high magnifications, which means we're looking at very small sample volumes. So sampling of my material becomes a primary concern. 
Uh, Peter Swan in 1970 estimated that all TEMs, every sample that had been looked at, had only examined a total of three tenths of a cubic millimeter of material. So if we extrapolate to today, we're probably looking at a volume no more than 10 to the third cubic millimeters or about one cubic centimeter of material for every sample that has gone into every microscope since the mid 1950s in 65 years. So that's something you want to be careful of, particularly if somebody asks you to analyze a sample that looks like this. You're looking at just a very small fraction of this sample, so you have to be very careful about your interpretation and extrapolating what you see in the microscope to what was happening on this truck wheel. So I'll show you some examples now of what we can get in the TEM. So, I mean, one of the most obvious things is you want to look and find out what size things are. That's particularly useful in nanoparticles. So we are looking here at some things that are sort of 40, 50 nanometers in diameter. And if you look carefully at these, you can see that they're a little bit darker in the center than at the edges. So you can see that in this particular particle. So we're seeing mass thickness here. We can tell that the sample isn't a uniform thickness. We can see it's a little thicker in the center. So we might guess that these are maybe not spherical, but close to it. And now you can also look at, uh, this is a montage of a number of images that I've pulled together. This was a composite material of uh, boron carbide out here, aluminum, and then some boron carbide here and here. So here in the boron carbide, I'm starting to see a thickness effect. This is thicker than here, so I see that it's darker. Up here, I have a platinum coating. Platinum is a very high atomic number material, scatters very strongly. So once we set up our image, that's going to be very dark in what we see. But now within the aluminum, you can actually see that there are variations in brightness. So here you see something, and you can actually even see it here in the boron carbide. You see these bands in there, and that's due to diffraction contrast. So in some places, the crystal is diffracting electrons strongly out to large angle, and those are being cut off from our image by our objective aperture. So because the uh, Bragg angles, the diffracting angles, are so small here on the order of a quarter to a half a degree, it doesn't take much bending in the material to see um, contrast. So here we're seeing this area is diffracting more strongly than this area right next to it, but it's only a fraction of a degree difference in, the, in its orientation. So any slight bending can give rise to that. Now this bending will also take place close to defects in the material. So here is an aluminum sample with a lot of what we call dislocations in there. And you're seeing the lattice distortion around these defects showing up as contrast. So the main crystal is not diffracting strongly, but we set up an imaging condition such that the, uh, the bending around the defects causes a lot of diffraction, and we see that as contrast. And then we can also, since we're seeing this diffraction contrast, we can actually start looking at diffraction of the sample and to start to see the underlying crystallography that we have. And we can see here that we have a mirror across this plane, which is telling us that that's a twin in my sample. So I'm extracting crystallographic information, not just from the image, but also from the diffraction here. So in the TEM, you can also do diffraction analysis in a similar way to what you can do in x-ray diffraction. The differences are that here we can look at much smaller volumes because we can focus the electrons down uh, and you much more than you can with an x-ray. And But uh, the electron diffraction doesn't have quite the same precision that you have in uh, x-ray diffraction. So you can't get as many significant figures in your d spacings. But you can see now 
uh, single crystals and start to measure angles between planes and get a lot more information out. Now I mentioned here that we have a twin and we can see that effect in the diffraction pattern. We can still see that in diffraction contrast. So these twins are not exactly edge on, these are twins in silicon. So we have that kind of effect here and we can see them and recognize them. And if we want to work really hard, we can go in and start to get atomic images of twins. So we see here uh, the silicon 110 dumbbells. So we're seeing the actual atoms in the bright spots. And then if we look at this plane right here, we can see that there's a mirror across it. And you can, if you look very carefully, you can see that these dumbbells are at just mirrored with respect to each other. So you can do this in atomic resolution, or you can work a lot less hard and just get diffraction contrast and get, for the most part, the same information. Now, I, imagine, I will admit this has a lot more G whiz uh, characteristics to it when you say you're showing people atoms. So what I've shown thus far are primarily materials samples, but we can also move into the biological community. And here we have an image of a mouse retina. Now, the biological tissue is primarily carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. These are all low atomic number elements and they don't uh, scatter electrons very well. So what we will do is we will use a heavy metal stain, a uranium, osmium, uh, lead, to stain features in the sample. And the stains are somewhat specific to the different types of features. So we're looking at here at a retinal cell and we can see here we have some mitochondria up here and there are apparently vesicles floating around it. We can see myelin sheaths around axons here, here, and here. And um, then just to make things interesting, we have staining artifacts. That blob is uh, nothing of any real interest. But this is a very common technique used in the biological community to improve imaging. So uh, we can then extend that to uh, collagen fibrils. So here's a TEM image of collagen fibrils and you can see the bands in here. And actually you can do, start to do diffraction analysis to start to measure these bands and start to calculate and see what kind of structure they have. So this becomes complementary information to the image that you have. And you can sometimes get the spacings much more precisely this way than you can this way. Continuing in biological stuff, uh, we are moving into the cryotem, which Yoshi will be talking about uh, down the road here. Um, as we start looking at, these are uh, apoferritin uh, molecules. As we start looking at these, we first need to find out whether or not we have a good dispersion of them for further analysis. So initially what we will do is a stained sample We'll use the standard staining techniques because it's quick and dirty and we can uh, get a nice idea of our dispersion. And once we have got our, all of our sample preparation techniques, then we move into the cryotem and we start taking images like this for what we call single particle analysis. What we're doing here is we're taking a nearly infinite number of particles in the hundreds of thousands, assuming that we have random orientations, and then we're going to be use all those random orientations to develop a tomographic type image or a 3D image of the molecule itself. This is um, time consuming. Uh, and once, once you collect the data, you, you're now spending some weeks or months trying to analyze it and reconstruct it. And uh, Yoshi is going to be talking about one of the programs that's used in this reconstruction. Now, I mentioned uh, that we can actually raster the beam in TEM. We can do that also uh, for biological samples here. Um, this is, again, so these are again some collagen fibrils, and this is a high angle annular dark field stem image of collagen fibrils. This is basically a mass thickness type image, 
And in STEM, anytime we have a mass thickness contrast image, we can legally invert the image to make it look very much like a TEM image. So this would be exactly analogous to getting a TEM image of a stained sample. Uh, I like to use the annular dark field because we can uh, basically improve the contrast quite a bit and work with lightly stained or unstained samples sometimes. However, the biological community is not used to looking at the inverted contrast of a dark field image. So we can legally uh, invert the contrast in this type of sample to make it look just like a TEM image. Now, continuing with STEM, you can use that not only for these lower resolution images, but you can also go to atomic resolution. And this is a growth of a perovskite, uh, strontium titanate, on a substrate. So you see the substrate atoms here. You can see there's some growth layers. And then they start making some ionic channels in here uh, for uh, interesting physical properties. I probably shouldn't go any beyond that. But you can start to see the locations of the atoms. So what you're seeing are the strontium atoms are very bright. You don't really see the um, titanium atoms very well in this particular uh, image, but they are located in between the strontium atoms. And then the uh, red are the oxygen atoms, which you don't see at all in this type of image. So continuing with the scanning idea, we can take a scanned annular dark field image, and now we can move into doing EDX analysis. So we have stepped the beam across, we have collected this, oop, that went faster than I expected. We, uh, we collected a dark field image here, and we collected simultaneously X-ray signal. Now from the X-ray signal then we could extract where the aluminum signal came from, where the tantalum came from, zirconium, moly, titanium, and niobium. So we can actually get elemental maps at, this is nanometer type resolution. And with some of the new microscopes we have, we can even extend this to atomic resolution. So what I hope I have done is to give you a feel for what TEM is and some of the things it can do. And if you have additional questions about this as to whether it might help uh, your particular research, feel free to either drop me an email or connect with us on one of the, uh, the things here. And with that, I think I'll call it finished and uh, open it up for any questions or comments.